My name is Katie Smith. I'm with the Marketing Communications team at Constellation, who is one of the conference sponsors. Welcome to Follow-Up System Failures, Stop Dropping the Ball. Our presenters for this discussion are Dr. Lori Drill-Mellum, Dr. Andrew Olson, Missy Lindau, and Mary Thewer. Dr. Lori Drill-Mellum bring, brings more than 30 years as a practicing physician to help guide Constellation's mission to champion those who devote their lives to healthcare, to the essential work of enhancing health and life. As a physician with a master's degree in public health, she brings a physician's perspectives as well as that of patients and family members in Constellation's efforts to promote patient safety and mitigate risk. Dr. Drill-Mellum's passion for and background in the studies of culture Behavior, leadership, and integrative medicine fuel her commitment and drive in serving the mission of Constellation. She's a fierce advocate for the well being of those practicing medicine and the critical importance of supporting them when they've been involved in a patient harm event. Preventing these events and mitigating harm once they occur is the core of her dedication to her work. Dr. Andrew Olson is an associate professor of medicine and pediatrics at the University of Minnesota Medical School where he practices hospital medicine and pediatrics. He also serves as the director of the Medical Educator Development and Scholarship at the medical school. Dr. Olson's areas of interest and study are the development of expertise in decision-making, methods to improve diagnostic reasoning ed education, and competency-based medical education. He is also the co-chair of the Education Committee of the Society to Improve Diagnosis in Medicine. Missy Lindau serves as the Director of Clinic Operations and Access at Lakewood Health System in Staples, Minnesota. Passionate about improving access to quality health care in rural areas, she's been dedicated to making a difference in the health and well-being of rural Minnesota communities for nearly 20 years. Lakewood Health System is an independent rural health care system founded in 1936 with a hospital and clinic in Staples, along with primary care clinics and a dermatology clinic and Skin and Laser Center in nearby locations. Lakewood is a recognized leader in providing innovative patient-based care, including women's specialty services, senior services, surgical, and outreach care. And finally, we have Mary Thewer, who is an active community member in Staples, Minnesota. She is the Lakewood Health System District Board Chair and serves on the Lakewood Health System Board, Patient and Family Advisory Council, Patient Experience, Finance, and Governance Committees. She is the trustee council chair for the Minnesota Hospital Association and acts as a community representative on the Diagnostic Stop Dropping the Ball grant program. Mary is fully versed on all aspects of insurance products, including negotiating renewals, setting stop loss levels, and presenting various renewal options to the self-insured pool. She holds a bachelor's degree in human biology as well as a doctor of chiropractic degree. Welcome to all of our panelists this morning, and Dr. Drew Mellum, you may begin. Thank you, Katie. It's great to see you, Andrew and Missy and Mary. I can't see you, but it's great to see you and fun to be able to talk about this very important issue together. So follow-up system failures uh, contribute to over half of Constellation's outpatient diagnostic error malpractice claims. Even when appropriate clinical steps are taken to lead to a correct diagnosis, diagnostic errors due to failures in follow-up care and care coordination still persist. This session will provide an overview of Constellation's malpractice claim data and how with the support of the Minnesota Alliance for Patient Safety, fondly known as MAPS here in Minnesota, Lakewood Health System used co-design to create a new process with community members and patients to minimize the possibility of test result follow-up system failures upon discharge from the emergency department. These are the learning objectives. So we're gonna talk about some of our malpractice data constellation and the contributing factors to the breakdowns in the care process. Then we're gonna look at Lakewood Health Systems experiences and learn best practices and engaging with the rural community to gather input as they develop new workflow processes for test result communications. And then we're gonna understand Lakewood Health Systems operational point of view on co-designing a new workflow process. So why diagnostic error? 
Diagnostic error, as most of you know by now, has not been recognized by many, including in the, the famous well-known to errors human report in the late 1990s as a significant issue. I think it was only mentioned a couple times in that report. Even as an ED medical director for 10 years and being on our local hospital, Ridgeview Medical Center's um, medical executive committee and QI committee, and sitting on the claim committee for Constellation when we review claims, I really did not appreciate the magnitude of diagnostic error until we really looked at our aggregate data, um, which was certainly helped by being a member of the comparative benchmarking system that Craco offers. But it's really interesting. You just don't sometimes can't see the forest through the trees and that was certainly the case for me and I think for our company. Many of you have heard some of these statistics by now during the first couple of days of the conference, but diagnostic error is the most common, most catastrophic and most costly of all medical errors. It's estimated that somewhere between 40 and 80,000 patients die annually from diagnostic error. And we often like to talk about the ripple effects from this. This isn't just patients who are impacted, it's their family, their friends, their communities, as well as the people who were taking care of them. When people talk about medical errors, 59% of them uh, say that they're diagnostic errors. And I think you've heard this figure multiple times over the last couple of days that more than 100 billion years billion dollars per year is wasted associated with diagnostic error. And one in three high harm malpractice claims is due to misdiagnosis. So diagnostic errors affect an estimated 12 million Americans each year in one way or another and likely cause more harm than other uh, medical errors combined. I'm gonna just share a very common type of diagnostic error case. It certainly has happened to me and it's happened to many of us in clinical care. This involved a 54 year old woman who was involved in a motor vehicle accident. She presented to her local emergency department with complaints of left arm and shoulder pain. She ended up getting some x-rays and uh, the ED physician read them as negative. They didn't find, he didn't find anything wrong with them. But on an overread, uh, it was noted that there was a, a potential problem in the left upper lobe. This was an overread that never really got to the ordering physician and never really got and never got to the patient. One year later, the patient presented to her family physician with complaints of a cough that would not go away. The FP ordered an x-ray and the radiologist noted in his report a left upper lung mass in the, um, in, and adenopathy in the chest x-ray. This chest x-ray was compared to the one that was done the previous year during the ED visit. And the radiologist noted that there was an incidental finding, as I said, on that first uh, film. That is an incidental finding, something that um, was noted, but really wasn't related to the presenting complaint. The family physician referred this woman to a specialist who diagnosed lung cancer. She underwent chemotherapy and radiation treatment, but it eventually died six months later. The medical experts, experts who reviewed the claim were critical of the hospital for not having a system to follow up on tests and images ordered in the ED. All x-rays read by the ED physicians were routinely overread at this time, but the hospital had no process to review the overreads note discrepancies and contact primary care physicians and patients for further care. This is a very common problem. It's a problem I dealt with as an ED physician and it's uh, really um, ubiquitous as far as, as, as I can tell. During the investigation of this adverse outcome, the hospital risk manager also discovered that the ED did not have a process to follow up on patients who were discharged with pending test results. And those of us that study diagnostic error know that there are, uh, it's very common to have discharging or test results pending at discharge, either from the ED or from the hospital. You've seen this definition many times now. Um, uh, Andrew Olson, who is a very active uh, leader and teacher in diagnostic error and the Society to Improve Diagnosis in Medicine, 
uh, can attest to the fact that it took a long time to land on this definition. There was a lot of work and discussion about this, but here's, here's what the agreed upon definition was when it was first the first report from the IOM for um, the uh, National Academy of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine uh, report in 2015. It's the failure to establish an accurate and timely explanation of the patient's health problem and communicate it to the patient. Traditionally, this is seen as the, was seen as a physician's job, but obviously we've moved beyond that to it's really the responsibility of the whole care team and the so-called designers of the system. So when we talk about follow-up system failures, um, we're talking about getting this information to the patients and their families. Um, we're making sure that the right people get the right information in a timely manner so that everybody understands the next steps. This includes not only communication to the patient, but also physician to physician communication. One of my favorite quotes that's taped on my computer by George Bernard Shaw is that, the single biggest illusion in communication is that it has taken place. We see this time and time again when it comes to follow-up system failures. So when we look at the claims that come into Constellation companies, um, we look at uh, the top allegations and they are in this order, surgical, medical, and diagnostic diagnostic allegations where there's been a delayed missed or wrong diagnosis. So with respect to diagnostic allegations, there are number three allegations that come in as claims and suits from patients and families. However, this is true not only for us, but also across the uh, country, that even though they may not be number one in occurrence, they're the number one in total incurred cost. So you can see that even though surgical claims are way more common um, than diagnostic claims, uh, it's the diagnostic claims that edge out the surgical um, claims just by a little bit. Where do these diagnosis related claims occur? 43% of them, yes, 43%. So the majority are much greater than the other two areas are in the outpatient setting. So that's significant and that's why we focus a lot on outpatient diagnostic error because we have a lot more opportunity to address it there. Then 23% in the emergency department and 32% in the inpatient units. And in the inpatient locations, it's uh, num radiology or Im imaging suites are number one, then the patient rooms or the ICUs, or then in pathology. The other important thing about these um, claims is that 49% of these diagnosis related claims are high severity claims. So that means that they include permanent injury and death. These are the top three misdiagnoses across all settings, 20% cancer, 18% vascular events, and 17% infections. This data is consistent with the national data. When we analyze the outpatient diagnostic process, we use the CRICO Strategies 12-step diagnostic process of care framework. This helps us map out where breakdowns occur in uh, outpatient diagnosis and where they're more common and where we might be able to make an impact in mitigating the occurrence of these diagnostic errors. What we have found with our data is that in 69% of our claims, there is a problem with the initial diagnostics um, assessment and that includes the five com components listed there. In the second section, 23% of our claims involve problems with the testing and results processing uh, section. And what I might also add now that um, I recall a request from our risk mitigation team is that as part of signing up for this conference, you were offered to take a diagnostic uh, error risk assessment. And many of you did, and we thank you for that. 
And if you haven't had a chance, it's still gonna be available for participants and anyone um, from your organization that would like to take it. It's a quick 40 yes, no uh, questionnaire encompassing the strategies that we've been learning this week. And it can give an insight on how your organization is doing and how you're benchmarking with the others. We'll keep it open for another week. I'm just gonna go back to the previous slide on the initial diagnostic assessment. And what we found from the people who did respond to this survey is that 67% of you hadn't thought through optimizing the EHR to support this stage of the diagnostic process. 44% haven't implemented strategies to involve the entire care team. 38% don't have a heightened process for patients with unresolved or worsening symptoms, which we see as a huge contributor in our malpractice data. People that have persistent or worsening symptoms um, is a problem. And the case that Dr. Gallagher also reviewed in his session last time about the woman who had a breast lump is a great example of that. And 38% had not assessed whether providers and patients have enough time during uh, visits. And that's been raised several times during this conference. In the test and results processing session section, uh, what we found from the people that completed our survey is that 86% don't have a plan for a delegate to review um, test results of a provider is out. Again, like the case that Dr. Gallagher uh, discussed, 83% haven't audited or stress tested their test and results tracking system. 71% don't have a way for clinicians to flag results that need clarification. And 57% don't have radiologists overread x-rays that are initially read by a non-radiologist. And I can tell you when we review our radiology claims, um, that is a significant issue where uh, physicians who are non-radiologists don't get overreads. They have a disproportionate number of uh, claims uh, relative to radiologists. And then we get into the follow-up and coordination um, stage. This is the third stage of the process where 50%, 52% of our claims involve breakdowns. And that's what we're really focused on in this talk and uh, the collaborative that you'll be hearing about in the next uh, section with uh, Jerry Castro from the Society to Improve Diagnosis in Medicine. With respect to the survey results for, um, that you gave us on follow-up and coordination, 57% haven't trained their care teams to assess health literacy when communicating about care plans. Again, think of the George Bernard Shaw quote that Many times people are nodding their heads about what to do with their um, test results or their referrals, but they may not really understand the urgency or the imperative nature of what's being recommended to them. So that is uh, health literacy obviously is a, a big issue in, our, in our, the populations that we serve across the country. 50% of uh, the response don't have a plan to manage patients who do not comply or follow up as recommended. 50% uh, don't have a plan to measure disruptive clinician behavior. 40% don't have a plan for next steps when attempts to contact a patient um, are unsuccessful. And again, we see these sorts of circumstances time and time again in our malpractice claim data. So when we look at our follow-up system failures as contributions to um, our claims, again, 52% of outpatient claims with diagnosis-related allegations involve a follow-up system failure. This um, is really an important insight as we think about uh, caring not only for our patients and their families, but also for the caregivers. So even when appropriate clinical signs are done to lead to the correct diagnosis, we still have diagnostic error because of a follow-up system failure. I might add that uh, Dr. Olson and I were on a diagnostic error collaborative here in the Twin Cities. And I think you will remember Dr. Olson, one of the participants of physician said, this is what keeps me up at night. I'm doing what I think is a good history and physical and ordering the right lab tests. And if 
my patients or I don't get the results or the instructions clearly, this will lead to a diagnostic failure. And so this is something that we really need to do for, to care for everybody all, all across the spectrum. We want to focus a little bit on top emergency department allegations as well. As you remember, 23% um, of diagnostic error allegations occur in the ED. So in the ED, diagnosis-related claims are number one in occurrence and loss. So you see diagnosis, medical management, safety, and medication errors. And when it comes to costs, um, they're the leading uh, cause of uh, loss costs um, in the emergency department. And I think many of you can imagine uh, why that might occur. Limited time, limited information, not necessarily easy access to medical records and test results and such. In the ED, the misdiagnoses um, are often vascular events, 32% of them, fracture dislocations and infections. And in diagnostic error claims, initial diagnostic uh, assessment is a contributing factor in 83% of our claims tests and results processing in 30% and follow-up care and coordination in 46%. So again, almost half of claims had issues in the follow-up and coordination stage. So we're really harping on the importance of uh, looking into this issue in our, our institutions and you know whether it's hospitals or clinics and seeing how we can really uh, develop reliable systems to follow up on these uh, care and coordination. So with almost half of our uh, diagnostic error claims happening this stage, we really wanna focus on that. And uh, I just can't emphasize it enough um, as a clinician and ED physician, how if we could wrestle with this topic and come to some conclusions about better ways to address it, um, we could make a big difference in our patients and families and our clinicians' lives. So what's different about these follow-up system cases? It's really that there's significantly more, of course, about the follow-up systems and processes and less about clinical judgment. They're about communication systems and processes, many, many systems of which can be improved and leveraged to address this. So because of our commitment to learn more about this, um, we have been helping uh, support the research project that you're gonna hear about from Dr. Olson and his colleagues up uh, at Lakewood Health System because we know that by engaging patients and families in a more meaningful way that we can help to address this problem. So I'm gonna hand the mic over to uh, our control back over to Jen and the presentation over to Dr. Olson and Missy and Mary. All right, we'll get my video started here and then I'm glad to uh, have somebody advance the slides as I talk. It's absolute delight to, uh, to um, I think I need the host to enable my video if possible. Um, oh, here we go. All right. Well, it's a real delight to, to um, be with everybody today. And uh, as a native Iowan, I'm especially excited to uh, have a chance to visit with you as well about this really important work that uh, is uh, still a work in progress as much of the work uh, is in this space. I'm going to introduce a little bit about this project and, and why we did what we uh, did and are doing. Uh, and uh, I also think really uh, want to talk about the really neat collaboration uh, between uh, the land grant uh, medical school in the state of Minnesota, the University of Minnesota Medical School, uh, along with some uh, really key um, uh, um, uh, other stakeholders, including Constellation and MAPS and Stratus Health, uh, and then one of our really important rural uh, health systems providing care for rural Minnesota. So we can go to the next slide. So 
um, uh, the, the, it's really exciting to look at all of these people coming together. Um, we had myself from the medical school as well as some medical students who are um, uh, stationed for nine months of the year when there's not COVID uh, up in uh, Lakewood, which is um, in northern, uh, north uh, of here in Minnesota. Um, but it really shows that I think to tackle this problem of diagnostic care, we got to get out of our silos. Researchers and educators like myself uh, need to engage with health systems uh, and not just our own health systems, but health systems that often don't get as much interaction uh, um, uh, with uh, the health, uh, with um, uh, researchers and, and others like this, but also that we so benefit from that because the, the really amazing thing about Lakewood Health and other uh, rural health systems is how deeply invested uh, the community is in ensuring uh, that they get quality care for them and their families. We can go to the next slide. So, so um, the, as, as we know, and, and Lori talked about this, we'll go to the next slide as well. We don't really need to, to dwell on this, but, but we know uh, that follow-up system failures are a real problem. Now, what's really interesting here is um, myself and many other diagnostic area researchers have spent most of our time in the cognitive space. Uh, why do we make the wrong decision? Um, and and follow-up system failures aren't necessarily the, the uh, the sexiest thing to, to work on, but they are really important. They actually cross, uh, cut across uh, many different spaces of medicine, across transitions of care. Um, and I think that, that most people in healthcare on the call or on the conference today at some point have uh, heard or even said uh, the words uh, that um, no news is good news. And I think that's just really awful um, and a symptom of a broken system that we have to seek to improve. You can go to the next slide. So we know this is a problem, so why hasn't it gotten fixed? Um, and one of our former so uh, Society to Improve Diagnosis in Medicine fellows, Dr. Janice Kwan, uh, led uh, this project along with others uh, as well, um, looking at a different healthcare system in, in Canada, actually, um, uh, but, but looking at um, uh, inc the, the follow-up for incidental pulmonary nodules um, in CT um, that were found um, in uh, care transitions. What's interesting is, so I practice medicine as a hospitalist. I do not get CAT scans to look for pulmonary nodules. I don't get them to look for adrenal nodules. Um, I get them to look for acute infections, dissections, things like that. But yet sometimes these things come up and we know that these things do not get followed up appropriately as we go to the next slide. So, so um, uh, we, we opted to really look at three um, different types of follow-up around diagnostic testing information. And this was really contemporaneous uh, with a project uh, that we're collaborating with with the American Association of Medical Colleges has a um, chief medical officer group uh, that we've been uh, delighted to collaborate with uh, to actually come up with an institutional assessment tool uh, to figure out how institutions actually do this follow-up. Um, there's some really nice work out there from AHRQ, but there's no clear roadmap for how a system should do this exactly. Nobody does it perfect. Um, there's solutions that are technology dependent, there's solutions that are person dependent, um, but they're all flawed. And so we decided, um, uh, th there's no clear exact perfect way to do this, but we divided our follow-up examples uh, into the very short-term follow. A patient comes into the emergency department, has a blood culture collected, it's discharged home, uh, needs to have that blood culture followed up. Same thing with urine culture. Um, this can same thing happen to hospital discharge as well. There's medium-term follow-ups, things like anemia or, or an abnormal creatinine that might not need to be addressed today, but need to be addressed in many weeks. And then there's the longer term follow up cases about pulmonary nodules, adrenal nodules, other so called incidentalomas that, yes, often don't have impact on the patient's health, but certainly may and often get lost. The challenge is what we didn't know launching into this project is how different are the systems that's evolved for follow up of very short term problems, medium, and long term problems. The other thing is, uh, I think all of us have learned uh, in our own healthcare systems that the follow up processes for most of the most uh, uh, often the follow-up processes that occur in healthcare systems have, are evolved, not designed. That is um, that, that you'll find that things are different on different days of the week based on which group is on call and things that are not highly reliable. If you ran uh, other um, uh, uh, other things that way outside of healthcare, you'd say, why would you do that? Well, if we go to the next slide. So what we did is um, we first um, said, what is the state of the data? So, so we spent some time um, actually doing process mapping. Um, before COVID, we actually had a really nice opportunity to spend some time up at Lakewood Health um, with providers, with, with people from multiple different stakeholders, looking at three key um, 
uh, uh, follow-ups uh, to, to, that we've looked at. Uh, the first was follow-up of, of culture results. Um, those are a you know, very short-term follow-up. The second was follow-up of abnormal creatinines, patients newly identified um, or with worsening renal dysfunction, knowing that there's disparities and outcomes are better if you get referred sooner uh, with abnormal uh, renal function, especially by the time you're to CKD3. Uh, the, the third uh, type of, of follow-up we did as well was abnormal findings, um, uh, incidental findings nodules uh, on chest radiography, both CT and chest x-ray. Um, and we did these at follow-up from the emergency department. And uh, the best thing ever is we have some medical students who are able to look into the data um, and help us get. So we're going to give you a snapshot of this data now um, as we continue. And just full disclosure, continuing in this project, uh, we all uh, stopped a little bit in the middle to deal with the pandemic. Um, and so um, as we look at the, the um, uh, chest radiography findings here, there is um, uh, the, the looking at 40 different samples here. Um, what we found actually is that a substantial portion of time, we looked at different parts of the failure process, as Lori talked about there. Was the finding noted in the ED note? Was the follow-up of the incidental finding mentioned in the ED note? So was it there? Was the follow-up planned? Uh, was, the note, was the finding noted in the patient instructions? Uh, and was what to do about it in the patient instructions? And then did the patient follow up? And was the finding addressed at follow-up? That is, the patient had a primary care follow-up, for example. Did the, was that addressed? And what we found here actually um, is that of the, the times where there was um, these cases, nearly 40 cases uh, in this rural emergency department um, that had significant findings, we found actually that that, that finding was addressed in, in the emergency department, or excuse me, in the ED note some of the time. The patient followed up more of the time, but interestingly, we rarely actually communicated this information to the patient, thus meeting the qualification for a diagnostic error. Um, and so, um, the, the, the challenges we, we, the, the nervousness we had when we launched this project was, is this a problem? Um, and we actually found out that it is a problem and it's a problem at various stages, all the way from recognition in the emergency department to communication uh, with the patient at the time of the emergency department and then the follow-up processes uh, to make sure the patient follows up. Now, uh, I'll give a brief parenthetical here as well. Um, most uh, hospital follow-up systems, so that are designed in healthcare systems, are designed around providers, not around patients. Um, and there's a reason that these systems don't work. Um, and so we thought it very important to not just try to just tweak what we're doing, but instead ask, how should we follow this up and co-design it with patients as we go to the next slide? Um, so uh, we also noted here for acute kidney injury, so patients with new acute kidney injury, um, we found here that often this was not addressed um, actually um, uh, in the ED note, but follow-up sometimes was, but the uh, acute kidney injury was not often the patient's instructions, and that's something I certainly would want to know, and there's no blame here. This is just the system in which we all practice, um, and so identifying that there is a clear need through this needs assessment and pre-chart pre, um, review uh, to evaluate uh, the this, this systems and design a new one. Interestingly, uh, we're a little bit better at following this up in the clinic uh, than others, uh, it appears. Um, and, uh, but it, and this is often because it probably flags abnormal um, in the, the lab results. But it's, again, interesting finding to show that there are a substantial number of patients who, who present have acute kidney injury in the in emergency department, um, but don't get that properly followed up. And we'll go to the next slide. The last thing um, uh, I'll just say here before I turn it over to, to the team from Lakewood um, is that I, I think if we did these numbers in all of our health systems, uh, they would be very similar. Um, and again, that's because these healthcare uh, follow-up systems are, are designed around providers uh, and not necessarily designed around patients, um, nor are they necessarily harnessing the power of technology, and we're often adapting the paper follow-up process we had. Um, I'm sure uh, Dr. Jill Mellum and others are familiar, most EDs have a culture book. Um, where the, one of the jobs of the morning provider in the emergency department during the slow hours uh, is to follow up uh, the cultures uh, that were sent uh, over the last 24 hours, often in a binder. Um, that's a common thing in many emergency departments, and actually it wasn't so long that at my major academic medical center we had that. Uh, it's unconscionable, actually, that we have that, uh, in my view. Similarly, um, it's crazy, and I'll just leave this thought as I turn it over to Missy, that in the modern era, why is life-saving life potentially threatening information relayed via fax. I think that's just an incredible uh, uh, um, 
indictment of the healthcare system, not to make us feel bad, but instead to identify, wow, we have a lot of work to improve. So the best thing ever uh, to, to do that is to do this uh, community engaged uh, research and quality improvement. And with that, I'll turn it over to Missy. Hello, everyone. I'm going to have um, go back one slide, if you don't mind. Um, so again, my name is Missy Lindo. I serve as the Director of Operations at Lakewood Health System, which is an independent rural healthcare system located in Staples, Minnesota, so kind of north central Minnesota. Um, we were founded in 1936, and we have a critical access hospital and also a level three trauma center, which we used for um, the purpose of this research. Um, also included into our research was um, our rural health primary care clinic. So we have five primary care clinics, as well as our dermatology clinic in Sartell. Um, we also, as a full system, have long-term care, assisted living, and an inpatient behavioral health unit. And really, truly have been a recognized leader in the industry for providing innovative patient-based care, including women's health, specialty services, senior services, and surgical and outreach care. So with that said, when we were um, approached for the opportunity to, um, to partner with MAPS and Constellation Stratus Health, we were super excited. Um, and, and with that, knowing that we could really capitalize and, and provide higher quality, safer care close to home for our patients. Next slide. So after our initial um, meetings and getting together with Dr. Olson and the rest of the team, we pulled together a group of individuals, um, key stakeholders, to map out our current state. And so the image on your screen, you can see um, the two individuals that are placing post-its on the wall there mapping out our process are our two um, physician uh, medical students, so RPAP students. And they were instrumental in this process from the very beginning. It was, it was incredible to, to partner with them. And then the gentleman that you can see to your left is a community member um, that was present during, during the time as well. Who else was present? Lab staff, radiology. Um, normally when we go to map out processes, we have managers at the table who are telling us, um, to be frank, what they think is happening. Um, when we went to, to map out our current state, we made sure to bring frontline staff to the table. Um, I will say as an administrator sitting in the room, um, that little bit of anxiety just building and building and building as it became very clear that everyone had a different version of the current process. And, and just like Dr. Olson mentioned, it often depended on which ER provider was working. Um, what did it happen overnight? or did it happen during the day? Did it happen on a weekday versus a weekend? Um, it seemed that we had all kinds of workarounds in our process. So this was a painful process that took um, a lot of time for us to get, to get through, to get to the bottom of it. Next slide, please. So I really just wanna highlight to those of you attending the conference, the importance of trusting the process. Like I said, um, just mapping out our current state took time, took incredible amounts of time from key stakeholders across our system and our community. And I very clearly remember sitting there going, oh my gosh, what are these community members thinking when as a group, we're not on the same page about our process? Um, and I will never forget one of the gentlemen turned to me and said, this is really complicated. Like this, this is a lot. I, you guys, we never even see what happens behind, behind the screen. And so um, take the time. I would encourage you to, to get the right people in the room and keep fighting through it until you have a good idea of what's happening. So you can identify really where you need to go from there. It's a super complex process. This isn't easy. Um, and everyone's voice at the table is, is important. I also would say it requires a lot of vulnerability as a system, kind of like I talked about that anxiety piece of, of wow, we really need to do a better job. And when you map it out on paper, that becomes very evident. Um, as you can see on the next slide, 
let you switch forward, looking at the process map for the chest x-ray. So this is, I'm not gonna go through step-by-step step on how we do things here at Lakewood. Um, I'll save you guys the, the insanity, although you can definitely look through. This is um, our current state, but all of the red stars indicate opportunities for process improvement um, and potential misses. So these things kind of like um, Lori had shared really can happen at different stages of the diagnostic process. So in the initial diagnostic, diagnostic assessment or the test result processing, we do see things um, that if we find a, a incidental finding, was it forwarded on to the right place? Was it routed to the primary care physician to be addressed? Is the primary care physician a Lakewood Health System primary care physician, or is this someone who is um, vacationing in our beautiful community and, and we don't have a, a good working relationship or in the same um, electronic health record? How is that handled? And then when it's sent to that primary, when we do communicate it forward and, and do that well, is it caught in that clinic follow-up visit and then um, all the way through the process. So as you can tell, it, this just really highlights exactly what we saw in the previous data of we have misses, opportunities for improvement all the way along our process. Next slide, please. So the next process map is really looking at our EGFRs. Um, and again, red stars indicate areas for improvement. And then the blue numbers that you can see on your screen are um, identified improvement tasks. And this was one of the things that was really important for us to stick to our rules of, we're not fixing this yet. We're just trying to map out what we're going to do. And for someone like me, who's very action oriented and really wants to make sure that we're, we're implementing and fixing things as quickly as possible, it's very hard to sit here and say, nope, we're not ready to talk about how to fix it yet. We have to finish mapping it out. Um, so that was key in our process. So again, we saw, um, we saw opportunities for process improvement happen at all three phases of that diagnostic process. First of all, did the ED provider recognize that the lab was out of range? Um, and did they diagnose um, AKI or worsening disease? Um, if not, those were both misses. Um, and then again, the importance of communicating it with the patient, which Dr. Olson referenced, and then the timing of that communication. Did we, um, did we document um, that in the electronic health record? And then also really looking at our discharge process from the emergency department. Um, our ER is much like any other emergency department. When our patients are there, they're, when they're leaving, they oftentimes still don't feel good. They're kind of sick and tired of, of hanging out with us and they're ready to get home. Um, so how do we make sure that we really have a good discharge education process in place, um, that we're communicating in, in patient-friendly language, that we're coordinating that follow-up care, and then printing their after-visit summary to make sure. Then what is also our plan to make sure that um, we almost have a double check in place that they're able that they attended their primary care visit and that this was taken um, that this situation was addressed. So those are um, some of the key things from a process finding. As Dr. Olson um, indicated, not long after the EGFR process map was completed, we had this little thing called COVID, um, which really took most of our, and especially in a rural health setting, um, our leaders, our, our working managers, they um, are dug in, in the trenches alongside of our staff and um, our senior administration was working diligently to um, protect our community and, and lead our organization through a global pandemic. So with that said, we had to stop some of our, our work on this project. And I say some of our work because once, you, as a group, um, our frontline staff and our leadership, once we sat and went through the work of mapping out this process, it doesn't leave your heart. When you see those potentials for a miss and how they might impact patients, it is something that we all truly carry forward and um, are committed to this meaningful work. Um, so with that said, we have every decision that we have been making regarding uh, patient care in the emergency department. This. Um, this diagnostic error work is definitely embedded and discussed and, and um, 
So we are super excited as a group to get back together and continue this work as we um, map our new processes and, and excited for that, um, that opportunity. Um, so now I'm pleased to introduce um, Mary, who is a valued member of our community and um, also serves um, here on our Lakewood board. Uh, very excited that she has kind of been one of the many community um, team members that have been involved in this process since the beginning. So I'm going to let Mary talk a little bit more about bringing the patient's voice and also <laughs> community engagement as we go through this process. I'm going to step back and Mary's going to join. Well, good morning and thanks for the opportunity for, for us to um, join this conference and talk about my job at, about the patient voice. If you would advance a slide, please. On this slide, we have a, a patient who's also an employee talk about um, her son's experience and to bring something real life to the group. Um, we initially started with our patient family advisory committee, which is a subcommittee of members from the community that work with our patient uh, engagement and um, group. And we met monthly prior to the COVID. And when we were asked to, to be part of this, several members of our group, and we worked hard to get different age, uh, ages of patients to be part of it. So you would hear the voice from them as well. Um, and they were excited to be part of the stop drop, dropping the ball. We held meetings. Uh, as you could see, we had members at the meetings. And um, I can share that the participants were really impressed with the openness and the sharing of the information and also recognize the vulnerability of the ED docs and the staff to share what's happening and where the potential drops were, but to also look at where do we go from here? It's way more than just uh, recognizing a drop without moving forward to say, how do we uh, move forward and, and make the changes in that? And it is hope that as we move out of the COVID, we will be able to continue this work and continue to have the community representatives. Part of the, uh, if you would move to the next slide, please. Part of the, the part of community engagement was that um, Lakewood has a food pharmacy and that is for the people that we've deemed uh, to be food insecure or lack of access of affordable and nutritious food. So we have this food pharmacy where these identified people come and get some educational components and also some, some food to take home to help them as they journey through their medical conditions. And so we, we developed a survey for them and they were very good about capturing the information that, that we wanted to get from them because many of them were frequent utiliz utilizers of the emergency department. And then we also uh, went out into the community to share the story. We presented to the Rotary Club um, and to some quilt groups. And we had several others that we had lined up but then as we mentioned many times, COVID hit us. So, that doesn't mean that we won't connect with them in the future as we continue to move through this um, exciting program and, and to identify what other um, actions do we need to take. So I, uh, that is my part of the presentation and we look forward to if there's any questions or anything that, um, you would like us to, to try to answer in the next few minutes. Well, one of the, 
one of the things we say very often here at Constellation and uh, MAPS, the Minnesota Alliance for Patient Safety, is uh, that it's so important to engage patients and families in, in these healthcare journeys that people are on. And our tagline is that we're stronger together and together for the common good. And this is clearly uh, such a multi-dimensional issue, um, as I think everyone can understand. It, it, it's really a much broader team, uh, including the patient and family. And I, I remember uh, attending a talk by Don Berwick at the Institute for Healthcare Improvement many, many years ago. And it was his position that patients and families are one of the greatest untapped resources when it comes to, you know, care, including, you know, uh, trying to figure out what's going wrong uh, with a person, you know, when they're seeking health care or a diagnosis. So uh, I, I'm so uh, heartened uh, that you're able to continue this work. And I, I, for those attending, I, I think you can appreciate from Missy and from Dr. Olson um, how uh, COVID-19 has really moved up to uh, really demand a lot of their time and energy, but they certainly have ongoing passion and commitment to this very uh, challenging problem, much bigger than I think any of us have anticipated until we really um, dug deeper into it. So. Uh, we sure appreciate your ongoing work in this area, but um, there are a couple points that or questions that were asked. Uh, one was directed at me. Do I know if ER volumes have risen in comparison to increased diagnostic errors in the ED? She has seen uh, uh, several primary care offices uh, have patients go to the ER uh, as a default phrase, if the patient's not getting better. Uh, this obviously is a very complex issue. Um, one of the things that we talked about earlier in the conference was the time constraints and the pressure, production pressures that people in primary care face, um, turnover time, um, not allowing for uh, deeper conversation, understanding and communication with patients and their family members. So I know that's a significant pressure that people in primary care outpatient clinics face. Also not access to quick test results when potentially there's a significant risk of, um, you know, a serious diagnosis, maybe even life-threatening diagnosis that we see. Um, I certainly understand why this happens. And, uh, you know, my position has always been if, Somebody needs help, whether it's an, uh, a colleague in a clinic uh, or a patient that has worsening or persistent symptoms. Um, I think to have an open arm posture is important. That being said, there are, are, are certain forces at play which discourage this, i.e., um, uh, you know, increased co pays for going to urgent cares or emergency departments versus clinics. So, so um, and certainly in the, the COVID during the COVID pandemic, there were a lot of people who were afraid to go to emergency departments for very understandable reasons. And so uh, what we do anticipate um, that, is that we'll be seeing more and more delayed diagnoses because of delayed screenings and testing and even certain treatments delayed um, because of, of the risk and threat of, of getting you know, ill from, from COVID. COVID-19. So, so, so many things at play um, there. Any, would there be any other comments that people would make along that line? Yeah, I, I, this is Andrew. I, I think, um, and, and thank you for that. And, and thank you to Mary and Missy for your um, just incredible work on this. Um, it, it's very interesting. I think that, that uh, so many times uh, we uh, seek to involve patients uh, in less deeply than we should. Um, and so uh, we say, oh yeah, we checked with the patient or we checked with the patient advisory committee, um, which is wonderful. I have no, not denigrating those committees at all. They're wonderful. However, if you see how many people on your patient advisory committee or your patient family advisory committee uh, don't have insurance, 
have trouble accessing broadband internet insurance, have trouble following up. Um, that is not representative of, of the communities for which we have the opportunity to provide care. And so I think um, really going out into the community, accessing folks who might access a food pharmacy, like it was mentioned, I think is really important. Um, and I think actually is a model for how we should design follow-up systems because uh, one of the deep concerns I have is that we could redesign a system uh, that instead of uh, um, addressing could actually uh, perpetuate or worsen healthcare disparities. Um, and uh, well, when we think of healthcare disparities, <clears throat> excuse me, we often think of them based on race and uh, uh, other really important visible factors. Um, in Iowa and Minnesota and many other states with large rural populations, uh, healthcare disparities are very real in rural areas and often result from different reasons. Um, and so I think that um, just addressing that is, is really important. Uh, and and um, I, I really commend the Lakewood team for, for, going, um, to, for going to that because I think um, uh, I, I really worry about uh, uh, when we don't seek to really deeply involve the community um, and patients with lower health literacy and, and um, other challenges for accessing care um, that frankly uh, are under addressed in the literature as well. So I, I just want to add into that as well and thank you uh, Dr. Olson for again highlighting that important point. And I think when we start looking at the data uh, of who is coming to our emergency department, we need to make sure that the community who's engaged in, in designing our follow-up system matches those demographics. Um, so with that said, I think this is something that can be challenging for many of you in attendance of the conference to, to do in your community. It's really easy to get engaged community leaders like Mary to the table to have conversation. Those are the people who make up our PFAC and they add tremendous value, but we also need to find ways to build on existing programs to capture their voice. These are people who often don't feel like included or welcome or, or they have their own challenges in attending sessions. So really trying to make sure that we reach out and engage them and that community engagement um, demographics and profiles match our, our data set as well. I think that's super important. Something that was, was essential to us here at Lakewood as we started this project. I also think it's really, really important for us um, who I practice medicine in a bit of an ivory tower uh, and uh, that, that what the, um, the, the challenges we see and the systems we design in major academic medical centers where some of this research occurs may or may not be generalizable. Um, and I approach that with deep humility. And, and so I think we have to, to not try to uh, fit square pegs and round holes, but instead identify best practice, but then make sure they work uh, for rural healthcare systems and, and other healthcare systems. We, uh, w one of the reasons we were really excited to do this was like many of you on the call um, here in the, in the Midwest with large rural areas um, often have um, uh, regional hospitals that are still on the grand scheme of hospitals, still small hospitals, uh, but serve as a kind of community hub um, for that care um, in contrast to, um, and the patient balance between health systems is less, a little less common, uh, still certainly happens as a challenge um, than in uh, large metropolitan areas where often that between systems stuff is a little bit hard, uh, a little bit more challenging. So this is a great time to make a plug uh, Jerry Castro is going to be talking from SIDM in our next lecture, but we're really trying to support a cohort collaborative of uh, people, risk managers, people in sa patient safety who want to address follow-up system failures. And, and we believe that we all can learn from each other. Um, that's one of the reasons we were helping support this research project, because we believe that some of the learnings uh, that you're gonna gain from this project, Stop Dropping the Ball, will be applicable. Even if it's is as high level as how do you engage your community? You may not come up with the same answers and solutions to follow-up system failures because every community is different and unique, but we can learn from how do we engage um, our community members, our patients and families and our clinicians um, in a way that's going to promote um, improved diagnosis, uh, because nobody wants wants to either uh, 
commit a diagnostic error, if that's the right verb, um, make a diagnostic error, a delayed diagnosis. There's a, one of us who went into medicine or nursing that ever intends for that to happen, but it certainly does. And particularly, as you can see in the emergency department um, is a very high risk location for that. And nobody wants to be on the receiving end. So I think we can really learn from each other and, and do better. <laughs>